Here, everybody, it's Cam and Tim. I'm going to show you this long introductory fusion session I did with a friend and stuff. So this video is definitely out of the norm and long, so I'll give you a quick overview. I did a session on the basics of fusion with a good streamer friend of mine, Baxcast. The purpose of this session is to understand how fusion works from a base level, especially if you're coming from a background of After Effects. If fusion is a tool that you've wanted to learn but the node-based workflow feels very daunting, then make sure you have DaVinci Resolve installed and follow along. Everything in this video can be done in the free version as well, so you don't need to buy Studio to do anything that I did in this session. This session was also streamed live on Twitch, so if you want to see more content like this, be sure to give it a follow. And without further ado, the session. Now this is the YouTube portion, here we go. <laughs> and we've entered right. YouTube! And we've entered YouTube! <laughs> Alright. So, the very first thing, uh, we're going to be starting with pretty much a, a blank project here, and I've only brought in one clip to, to showcase how some of this stuff works. Um, but the keys to knowing how Fusion works is understanding that there are multiple ways to enter Fusion. Um, so we're going to just kind of describe that. I'm just going to throw a random clip in here. It doesn't matter uh, what clip you have. Uh, this is okay. just an example. Um, but there are a multiple variety of ways to enter fusion so the the way that we're going to approach this is we're going to see how we enter fusion we're going to go over a bunch of basic nodes uh, especially the ones that are kind of core to if you're used to after effects we'll run through some of those mm. and mm -hmm. how you can kind of translate that after effects knowledge into fusion especially because they are extremely different workflows so you have a better head start on like how um how everything functions um cool. so the so the first thing we're gonna do is uh we're just gonna the first way to enter fusion is pretty much the most uh straightforward way you you're hovering over a clip and you click on the fusion page and then it opens fusion on that clip itself so any effects you pl apply onto it and you don't have to follow along with this part i'm just showcasing an example like any effects mm. will be applied to what to to that clip directly um, I'm going to go ahead and delete that. Um, the second way is you can actually add a blank fusion composition. And if you go up to your effects tab up here um, and then go toolbox effects, you'll see the fusion composition. So we can bring that in here. And then that way, when you open up fusion, now you're on that fusion composition. And when you open in a fusion composition or like a blank one that you just drew, brought in, you'll notice that this is the only node that's in here, only the media out. And we'll get into why that is in, mm. in just a bit, uh, because that is a key component of how Fusion works. Um, oh. the, the third way, and I'm going to like uh, make a split clip here so I can move, uh, so I can showcase this. So you can actually make a Fusion comp and bring in multiple clips at the same time. So if you highlight these two clips like so, right click and select new fusion clip i don't know why that mm. keeps opening um and then click on the fusion page then now you'll notice you oh, have two media in nodes. nodes you have two okay. media ins and it automatically creates a merge node which we'll get into what the merge node all of the stuff that it mm. does or at least the key components of what it does in a little bit um mm -hmm. so we okay. have the two media ins here because now we can adjust multiple clips separately so that's that's kind of the key component to to recognize there um and then if you want to go into that fusion clip and adjust like the timing of some other clips you can right click on it and select open in timeline and then you can see it's kind of like a compound clip or if you're used to premiere nesting it's almost like a nested clip um so you can open it up and adjust parameters if as you as you want to i'm going to go ahead uh, so and playing you um so once you create the fusion clip going in and saying uh open in timeline is you uh being able to go back and adjust what you like compressed into the fusion clip pretty much yeah it's like going inside of a nested clip and then adjusting each clip individually because you know if i if i move the whole thing then it's then it's moving the like everything inside of it um but right, you can right, open in right. timeline and, and do it like uh, so to get back, would you just double click fusion clip in the media bin in the in your or in your uh, master where your stuff is like once you go to open in timeline? 
Uh, to oh to go oh yeah 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 so sorry I forgot that so well, yeah once you're in this fusion page if you go down to the bottom left right here you'll see where it says timeline one and fusion clip just double oh, yeah. click timeline one and it goes right back to where you were yo you All can right, also adjust your that is, that's huge yeah you can also adjust your timeline view options so if you have open in timeline right here you can just switch back and forth like so so just to show the, show that again in case you didn't see it if you click on this icon right here and then this first button right here this allows you to have stacked timelines is what it's called um, and then that way you can have like however many timelines you want uh, on this on this bar right here so that way you can easily go back and forth between them and you don't have to like hover over it right click go open in timeline uh, that's another option you can do as well um, so I'm gonna go ahead and I'm actually gonna just undo this and go back to where it was. Do, 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 do. Okay, cool. All right, and then the last way that we can go into Fusion um, is is similar to adding a new Fusion composition, except this one's slightly different. So we'll actually go, we're actually gonna bring in an adjustment clip. Um, mm -hmm. Okay. I'm just gonna throw that over there because it just doesn't want to leave me. Okay. Goodness gracious. Okay. It just, dude, it's attached. It's, it's, it really is. Yeah. Okay. So <laughs> I'm just going to have to deal with that. It won't, it shouldn't, shouldn't appear when we actually go into fusion, but you know, that's, that's just there. Okay. So we have an adjustment clip here. Now this one's particularly interesting, uh, cause when you go into fusion, you see, you can see the clip is here, but we're not actually adjusting this clip itself. We're actually almost like placing effects on top of it. It's like an effects layer. Um, right. So as an example, like let's say I wanted to do a, turn this into a transition. Um, so I, you know, place a transform node here. And again, we're gonna get into how nodes work. Don't worry about the functionality of this just yet. This is just an example. Um, but let's just say from here, I want it to just like, you know, do this. I'll set this to mirror and, you know, do this wee type of dumb thing. Uh, mm -hmm. so actually I'll go one more. Okay. So now when we go back to the edit page and we play that back, we, we can actually see it kind of doing like a, a weird transition. You can like add blurs onto it as well. But the great thing about it is it's not being applied to this clip directly. It's been applied to this adjustment clip. So I can move, mm. I'm going to just shorten it so it's easier to see. I'm going to, I can move this over here. And now that adjustment clips are being applied over here, wherever that clip is. Ah, brilliant. Yeah. Okay. So any, so any effect you apply onto here, you can move this adjustment clip wherever you want. And the effects in the adjustment clip will be applied to whatever is underneath it. Mm, uh, right. Not okay. over top of it. So it's like if uh, so, let's say this was over top, and this is where the adjustment clip is. Then yeah. you know nothing happens, of course. But once it's below it, so, then you see right. it happening. So, so I've been messing around with adjustment clips, and so I, de I definitely got the hang of them. What what I guess is cool about what you're showing me is that adjustment clips go into Fusion. Like yes. if you're if you're there, then what you are doing in Fusion is just affecting the adjustment clip. I've only ever messed with them just staying in the edit tab and not doing anything in Fusion. Right. Yeah. So they they function pretty much the same way, except you have a lot more flexibility. So this adjustment clips mm, are a great yeah. way to. Um, I'm just going to reset this real quick so there's nothing on it. Adjustment clips are actually a great way to make custom transitions. Um, and I can just, and I, again, a lot of this stuff I'll get into later. Um, but let's just say uh, I'm just going to move forward to this part of the clip here. Bring this over. And again, you don't have to copy this part. This is just for, for reference sake. Um, but let's say I wanted like a half second transition here. Um, I can place this in the middle of these two clips right here. So now when I go into the fusion page on this adjustment clip, I can only see, it takes a second to load it. I can only see these parts, but you can see where that cut is right here. But it's only, this is only affecting the, the fusion transition or the adjustment clip. So if I go into transform here and I'm gonna add a blur as well, I can set keyframes from here to, I think it's like, yeah, minus 1.5. And then, 
and then mirror this again. And then I can set keyframe to, to blur here. So I'll set it to zero, keyframe here, set to here. And I could probably do a directional blur that would probably look a little bit better, but this is just a quick example and then go back. So now you can see it blur as it moves and then blur out. And I can play this back. You know, obviously you would fine tune that a lot, but that's kind of the idea of what's happening here. And then again, mm, this can go then okay. this can go anywhere. So whatever you apply, apply this over, um, it'll be applied in that in that instance right here. So mm, okay. Yeah. Those are the uh, so those are the primary ways to go into Fusion. Uh, I'm just going to go ahead and remove all this now, um, and we're actually going to just start a blank Fusion composition. So if you don't have any clips to to work with, that's totally fine. We're just going to start uh, just going to start blank. So go ahead blank. and drag in a Fusion composition from the Effects okay. tab. I know my webcam's uh, blocking it, but we're just dragging out a fusion composition right here. Okay. And once you do that, go ahead and open up the fusion page. So now let's uh, let's talk a little bit about what these media in and media out nodes do. You'll notice that when we do a blank media uh, a blank fusion composition, we only get a media out, and that's because there's nothing coming from the edit page. Um, going into fusion so that's the point of the the media in nodes that's okay. why when you make a fusion comp on multiple um, media or on multiple clips in the edit page it'll bring in two media in nodes so a media in is telling fusion this is what's coming from the edit page and then right. the media out is what's going back to the edit page and then everything right. in between is um, it's just anything that you customize in fusion that so that's sense. so that's kind of how that works. So just so just for understanding, um, and I'll just add a media in as well. Um, if you, let's say you had like five layers of uh, of a fusion clip, but you wanted to select specific instances of it, it actually will tell you which layers um, you have. So you can s select one of your five layers in here if you don't want every single one of them. Uh, to be applied in here, or you want two instances of the same layer, you could also do that too. Um, mm. So that that's where that would be helpful. Uh, so I'll go yeah. ahead and delete this media in node. Uh, so now that we understand like how media in, media out works, now we're going to start like actually adding stuff. So the first thing we're going to uh, add, and and just for awareness, if you if you don't see a node listed on here that you need, if you press Shift Space, this tool will come up and it'll show you all of the nodes inside of fusion there i have mm, so cool, many right. nodes inside here because i downloaded a, a bunch of plugins so <laughs> this is an absurd much more amount than you will probably see uh but this is still how you <laughs> would still navigate quite through. a few there's like, still there's still, still a lot it's still a lot yeah. yeah so it's like if you wanted um i don't know like uh what's a good example yeah, let's because we did the directional blur earlier. So directional blur is not a def, uh, default node here, but you can type it in here um, and then select a directional blur and then you know does double click, hit add, and then boom, you have the directional blur inside here. So that's how you would navigate to, to pretty much all of your nodes uh, at once. Mm -hmm. You can also go to um, effects and under tools, you have all your nodes here as well, as well as open effects um, and any mm -hmm. templates. Okay. And, yeah. And any templates that you might have downloaded, which if you haven't seen Magic Animate, shout out to Mr. Alex Tech. He made probably the the greatest uh, plugin for Resolve I've ever seen. Magic Animate, download it. You're welcome. Okay. Uh, so now we're going to go ahead and bring in a background node. So go ahead and click on that. Um, and backgrounds are effectively like solids in After Effects. Um, and you can see this actively if we pipe this into the media out so every node has well not every single node but most nodes have inputs and outputs so this okay. this gray square is your output this is telling the node that it's going to the next point a node is literally a point um that's that's literally what it means um so okay. you can have like multiple points and 
It's just like different connections to your whole puzzle, essentially. So we're going to click on this square and then drag it over to media out and you can just hover over the node. And now you see we have this black node inside the or black solid <laughs> inside the canvas here. Um, and you, you can adjust mm, the color right. and do all that and you know select whatever screen color you want. Um, and then we can also do other things with it. Like uh, if we go to alpha and drag it down, you can see we can add transparency and this is resolves transparency levels. So if you drag this all the way down and all of these set to zero, you basically have a transparent layer. Um, and I'll tell you why that's important in a little while. Um, but now let's say we wanted to add on to that. Um, this is where merges come in and merge. You can think of merged nodes as your layers in, in After Effects. So we're going to hit merges right here. So we're going to click on merge. And if you have background selected, it'll automatically put it in the right spot. And you'll notice wow. we have a couple different so inputs had, right here. So, so I had media out selected and it put it after media out. Does it just do it after whatever node you have selected? Yes. It okay. Typically, if it if it can go after it, then yes, it will. Perfect. Okay, cool. Cool. Okay. So now um, on our merge node, we have three different inputs right here. Uh, you'll see there's a yellow one, a green one, a blue one. So the yellow one, if we hover over it, it says background if we hover over green it's foreground if we hover over blue it's effect mask uh, so what this means is let me just i'll just make this background blue um i'll make it fully opaque that's fine um, now let's deselect our nodes and let's click on another background node so now we have two okay. and let's drag the output of this into the foreground part of the merge so now you'll see it turn black again. Mm. And let's uh, let's say, uh, let's bring in a transform node to better showcase this. So transform node is right here. We'll get into all the stuff that the transforms can do in a bit. So let's mm -hmm. bring in here. And all we're gonna do on this transform node is just drag down the size. So now you see we have the background one, which is blue in behind. Uh -huh. So we just have two layers. Yeah, We've, we, we have, have two layers. Yeah, we yeah, effectively yeah, have two okay. layers. And then you can just keep adding layers, like keep adding merges like so, and put it as many, literally as many as you want. Um, so- But but this merge this merge alone, a merge can only have two. Right. Like only one have, merge node. Right, okay. one merge. It basically, a merge just adds the capability for something to go over top. Okay. So it's okay. just it's just adding layers. That's that's literally what Merge is doing. But it also has cool. an additional feature, which we'll get to in a sec. Um, but there's another there's another quirky thing here. If you click on the merge, and then let's say you accidentally piped your uh, your nodes into the wrong inputs, and you don't want to like you know click and drag off, and then drag onto the other one, and just do that whole complicated mess. Just click on merge and press Control T. And then if you see what that did there, it actually switched the foreground and uh, background inputs without you having to click and drag off. So you can switch them back so now, and forth by pressing Control so T. If, if I went to, so if I went to background one right now, oh, it doesn't have it. Hold on. I'm going to just go a little off script here. I'm going to go background <laughs> one. I'm going to add a transform node to it. And yep. then I'm going to make, I'm going to change that size. Ah, ha, ha. Yeah. Oh, ha. Okay. And then if I push, go back to the merge node and push Control T, we can just pop that. Ah, brilliant! Yep. Now All you right. now you can tangibly Vibin. see like Control T right here will flip Vibin. them back uh -huh. and forth. Yeah. So Sick. okay. So that's a that's a key aspect of of merge nodes is you can quickly switch them. Now uh, the last part that we want to get into is the effect mask, and I'm not going to go too far into this, uh, but effect mask is basically if you have an input of like some sort of mask, it's like a specific shape or a specific image that you want to put on. Mm. Uh, I'm just going to mm. throw another background note onto it. Um, okay. And I put this over. Um, actually, I'm not going to do a background note. I'm going to do a fast noise, and we're we're not really going to talk about fast noise that much. Um, but Ooh. let me just pipe this in here. And you'll see that the mask is being applied only to what's on the foreground, not on the background. 
um, so I can like increase the contrast oh. and stuff. So you can see so that mask only it doesn't affect background and foreground. It only affects foreground. Only affects foreground. So yeah, effect mask will go over top of the foreground. So you can see that tangibly too. If I switch these again, now you can see it's going over the other one. Now that the background one is in the foreground. Uh, so so yeah so effect mask uh, applies right so effect mask applies to the foreground not the background uh question for the uh for all our little uh things around our nodes it looks like once you have um connected nodes they reorient to make it easier like when the fast noise when you attach that one to the merge effect um it flipped the output from the right side of the box yeah. to the top. It, it'll do that. Is that just something it'll automatically do? Yes. Yeah. Typically, it'll okay. just automatically okay. do it just to make just so because if like uh, this was because see how as I move it around, it kind of reorients them. It just it does that automatically to just kind of keep the connections visibly able to, like easier to see. Um, okay. Okay. So yeah, um, that's kind of why it. Uh, orients like that um and of course like once you start adding a bunch of stuff it's really key to keep things organized now there is another way to keep it organized and this is also a nice helpful tip i'm just going to drag this up right here so it's easier to see uh but if you right click inside of your uh fusion comp if you go to mm -hmm. arrange tools and select two connected now you'll see it it kind of has like points where it snaps like if I go into the oh. vertical spot, so you can like have it snap, he snap here, snap here. So it's like if the line is straight, it'll snap. But you can also get even more granular with it. Uh, and if you go and select to grid, now it snaps onto that grid that's inside of the the fusion oh, cut. So now you can keep snap. things very clean, like so. And like look how much better that that looks. It's so much easier of an interface to to work with so now you can like easily drag things without having to be precise so um, i'm gonna go ahead and leave that on for the duration of the tutorial just so you guys are aware okay. but just so you know where it is it's under arrange tools and you can turn those on and off uh however you however is, you'd like do you think that it is it necessary to have two grid and two connected or can you just have two grid or are they both Doing you can just different. have two grid. I haven't really okay. seen if you have two grid selected, two connected doesn't really do anything. <laughs> okay, got it. So got it. okay, um, yeah. So that's that's pretty much the the big parts of the of the merge node. Um, you can also adjust like if you open up your inspector window, um, you can also adjust various parts of the of the merge node. And again, if you have uh, if you adjust the merge node center size and stuff again it's only adjusting what's in the foreground um and not the background okay so you can also do your standard apply nodes or apply modes <laughs> uh not nose uh, <laughs> see what i didn't do there uh, 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 all right uh, so okay. yeah you have all your standard apply modes here uh that apply to your foreground um and you know you have your operators like and operators just tell uh the merge node especially when you have a mask on top of it um how you want to uh like how you want to apply a mask so this these can do different things on your mask and we won't get too much into that because that gets like really technical and stuff so we're just going to keep it default sure. um and not worry about it um so you also have your edges and this this applies for any node that has um, edges on it but let's say you have like harsh cutoffs um, and you want it to extend infinitely uh, you can select edges and then you can either wrap um, or duplicate and I'll, I'll remove this mask so it's easier to see um, you can mirror let me shrink this so the, there's a bunch of different things that you can that you can do with it, mm. and there we go. If I bring size down, it's much easier to see. So duplicate will do, do different. Yeah, here we go. Mirror does this. So, um, huh? Okay. Yeah. So they yeah. just they have different things that can if the if it if the merge node hits an edge 
on something, then it can extend beyond that edge is basically what that means. So I can, you know, as I can move along here, <laughs> you can use this for a transition or something. I don't know. But anyways, yeah, sure. um, so I'm just going to reset these to defaults here. Um, all right. Now let's get into some masking. Um, so now masks are, these are pretty much all the masks you're really going to need to worry about. There are a few more, but they have, there's not, hasn't really been anything else I've found super useful. Um, so let's go ahead and just, uh, add a, here, I'm going to actually take these transforms and actually I'm just going to remove the transforms. It's going to be a lot easier, uh, that way. Um, so cool. yeah, if you just click on the transform nodes and delete them, this will be much easier to showcase this way. Um, when you so, are, uh, just to make sure when you're deleting things, are you using the backspace key or something else? Backspace. Yeah. Okay, cool. All right. So let's add a rectangle node and now we can connect that into the effect mask input of our background node and now you can see we have a rectangle mask that we can adjust however we want uh, we can invert it we can adjust the border width and border width will allow us to stretch beyond or within the bounds of the mask um, and mm -hmm. we can add soft edge for some blur, which is always nice. Um, but here's a, another interesting thing. You can apply masks or you can apply nodes onto multiple nodes at a time. So I can click and drag this rectangle node output also onto the other background. Oh God. Now the mask is being applied to both of them at the same time. So you can connect okay. multiple okay. nodes to multiple, you can connect a single node to multiple nodes at a time. And this can yeah, be, yeah. this can help a lot with like compounding stuff. So let's just say, I'm gonna remove this background here. I'm gonna remove this. So let's go ahead and let's just delete the rectangle in background. I just wanna showcase this real quick. I kind of unscripted this, yeah. but um, so let's say we have a background here. I'm going to switch the merge because it has to be in the background. So make sure you have a background going into the background of the merge. And that's pretty much all you have. Okay. So hold on. Quick, quick pause. Yes. You, you have switched. Okay. You've switched the background one node from being connected to the foreground to being connected to the, the background. background. Right. And I just press control T to do that on the merge node. Um, when I did that, it still had it connected as both foreground and background. Oh, it went into both? Just, oh, so if you oh. need to remove that, so if you hover your mouse over the, the line, you'll see where it highlights blue. Yeah. Just click it, and it'll disconnect it. Oh, you can just click to disconnect. Okay, yes. okay. Got it. Yep. Cool. And then you can click and drag. Onward. All right. All mm. right. So now, uh, let's say we wanted this background to... Uh, actually, I'm just going to bring in a transform node by itself. So deselect your node and then just click on transform. Okay. Excuse me. Um, and I'm also Excuse. going... Thank you. <laughs> um, and I'm also just going to bring in... I'm going to... Yeah, let's just bring in color corrector. That'll that'll be, that'll be work. Um, and don't worry about all the different inputs for color corrector. It's, we're not going to get into that. It's not going to matter. So okay. let's go ahead and drag the background onto the color corrector it'll automatically put it into the right one and then let's gra go ahead and drag the color corrector into the transform and then the transform into the foreground of the merge one so now if i shrink this down in size we're using the same background node twice but i can Im individually move one instance of it So how did, you, wait, how did it get to be a different color? Uh, so I went into, oh yeah, so in color corrector, uh, I just yeah. adjusted the hue. Oh, 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 got it. Yep. Okay, okay, I'm, I'm on board. All right. <laughs> yeah, I kind of glanced cool. over that. Um, okay, so yeah, so that, but that was just to showcase, like, you can use the same instance of a node on 
it, it like multiple times as long as you pipe it through some other some other stuff so like if you wanted to use the same image twice but you wanted to apply effects to that image in multiple in, in different ways you could literally pipe them into into different stuff so like let's say i put in a color corrector down here oh another tip actually uh while mm -hmm. while i do that so if i click and drag and hold shift you can see that the the lines light up when i hover over it if i'm holding shift and let go of the mouse right here it automatically connects it so you don't have to like click and drag the output into the input and output into input again you can just press and hold shift hover over the line it'll automatically connect it wow yep wow. so now so now if i just Whoa. hue on this instance <laughs> Whoa, we're having a party. Okay. Oh, yeah, we're having a rave. <laughs> <laughs> Watch out, Sushi Dragon. Here we come. <laughs> oh, my. You better watch it, bro. <laughs> <laughs> Goodness gracious. All right. So, but yeah, so you can adjust multiple instances of the same node and then merge them back together and do whatever mm. you want with, with either one. Okay. So, okay. All right, so that was a so that was a fun sidetrack. I uh, just wanted to point that out because I didn't take a note on that, and I forgot to mention it before. I forgot to think about it. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, no, so that, I, and that and it's definitely yeah, definitely viable, definitely mm -hmm. good to know for sure. So appreciate yeah. that. So it's really really helpful. Um, all right, so next uh, let's go back into masking. Okay. Uh, I'm just going to move this up here just for ease of seeing because my webcam's in the way. Um, but yeah, so we brought in the rectangle node, and that's right here. And we clicked mm -hmm. and drag it onto the background. And, you know, we can move it around, adjust the width, the height, the corner radius. Now, corner radius is a way to get rounded corners on a rectangle mask. And that'll, if you go all the way up to one, then that'll make a perfect round spot uh, wherever. Like if these uh, were even, it's going to be kind of hard to make it perfectly even, but um but yeah that'll that'll make it so that uh you have mm. basically a rounded rectangle however you want to do it that you know the options there so oh, okay yep um so let's go ahead and scrap that and then we have the ellipse mask and this one is obviously circular shaped already so we can do that um and if you hover your mouse over uh either the corner or the sides like top bottom mm left and right if you hover over top bottom left or yeah, right like you can adjust you know? width like this or you can adjust height um, or you can adjust size so it'll adjust yeah. width and height together wow so that's how you can adjust both all the same parameters are here as well um it you know pretty much similar these are ellipse and rectangle are very similar they're just different shapes um mm -hmm. so those are there too and then we have we're going to delete that and we're going to go ahead and go to the polygon mask this one's probably the most common one i use um okay and i'll pipe that into the background and i'll show you why now you're going to see nothing initially right. but if you have polygon selected uh what we can do is we can click 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 and actually just draw the mask in and of itself oh wow so that's okay. how you so that's how you draw a mask with a with a polygon node and you can keep adding points as well if you wanted to and then you can also Wait, how are you how are you adding the points sorry i just click on how the line adding... so if you have oh, this oh okay yeah. okay so if you have uh oh, wow. so yeah you have you have your options up here if you have insert and modify selected which is this third one uh that will allow you to click on it and and move it I believe okay. if you have click append, that won't happen. Or no, it still will. Oh, because it automatically switches. I didn't. It won't let you click on that. Um, so, and then of course you can, you know, drag your bezier curves as well, like so, and just do all sorts of weird, weird stuff with it. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. So that's your that's your polygon mask in a nutshell. Of course, you can you can adjust your. Uh, you can adjust like 3D rotation on it as well if you wanted to. You can adjust size, your center, and of course your border width and soft edge. It's all pretty standard. Um, something I didn't mention uh, was border style. 
Um, and this this goes for the this wasn't on the circle or the ellipse mask because there's no corners. Um, but if you go to border style and hit this, it's gonna be kind of hard to see. Actually, I might I might not be able to do it with this. Yeah, I'm gonna do a rectangle and show this. You don't have to do this part. This is just for example. Yeah, there we go. Okay. So if you if you use border style on a on a rectangle or polygon mask and you increase your border width like above the, the threshold of where this mask is, um, mm -hmm. then you can either round it off. Um, make it a rigid edge, oh, yeah. okay. or you can okay. just do your standard, like just extends past it like so. So just a little, little tip there. Um, so there's a lot and that you can when, do. When we could, when we could do that with the polygon mask, that just wasn't showing up because I had my border width wrong here. I'll show you on the, on this do 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 do. All right. So yeah, let me increase my border width here. I'll go to a rigid edge. So it's because I made these sharper. Um, so yeah, you can see this is a rounded corner like here. If I do this, cuts ah. it off like that, and bring here, and then, yeah. But does that only do that outside of the masked area if you increase the border width? Is that the only time the border style is gonna be useful as far as? Most of the time, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Like, cause like, if you, if you look here, it's not making any difference when it's inside it. Right. But okay, yep, that makes sense. Uh, yep. So so now let's uh, we'll do a kind of a fun thing, and this applies to any of the masks as well. Um, but what we're gonna do, I'll just do this on a rectangle node, uh, but you can do this on any one of them. Uh, we're gonna go ahead and apply the rectangle to the background, and what we're gonna okay. do is we're going to turn off solid, so it'll show nothing. But you'll see we got a couple new parameters here. Mm -hmm. So this part's interesting. So let's go ahead and bring up border width. Oh. And you'll notice we have uh, we have a webcam border. <laughs> hey. uh, yep. So now, but now you can watch what happens when we drag length down. We can actually animate a line drawing. Or let's say we wanted what it the? to, yep. We want it to be only like halfway. If you adjust position, you can have that rotating as well. What? So you can animate it drawing on, and it, you'll notice that even when it's at zero, there's this still this little blue dot here. Um, right. But if you click on this border style, which says flat, if I can forward click on it, there we go. It goes away, and then it lines up perfectly there. Ah, so that's just the the rounded edge. And then yeah. you could change that dot into a square by doing whatever the one on the right is square. Pretty much, yeah. Yep, so you can <laughs> do that. So <laughs> and we'll we'll get into the keyframing, but you can you can have this be looping indefinitely as well. Um, but we'll we'll get into keyframing in a in a little bit. So um that's Pretty much the majority of what you what you need to know for masks is a lot that you can do with them. They're very flexible, very powerful. Uh, we're going to go ahead and uh, I'm just going to restore the rectangle to default and just keep it on for now. Um, I'm going to move this up and let's see. I know I covered the transform node already. I'm just going to make sure that we covered all that we needed to. Um, I love my wife. Uh, <laughs> yeah, agreed. Yep. <laughs> but you love her too? It's, it's just kind of well, weird. Uh, hmm, that did get a little <laughs> weird, didn't it? <laughs> All right. Ladies and gentlemen, okay. Da Vinci Resolve Tips and Tricks with Camera Tim. <laughs> <laughs> and Mrs. Tim. Apparently. <laughs> okay. Cool. All right. Dope. So now, um, with, uh, with your transform node, obviously you have your center. Uh, parameter which adjusts where it uh, where it is. Um, your pivot is very similar to anchor point in After Effects. Okay. It, it basically is anchor point. Um, and the reason why this matters is, uh, let's say I wanted to adjust size from here. It's you notice uh, it's it's adjusting size from where. 
the pivot is. So, you know, as I move the pivot along and move size, that's where it scales from. So pivot that's is basically acting like like if you're if you're messing around with zoom like in yeah. the edit right in the edit tab. Yeah, I got gotcha. you. Okay. Yep. So basically, it just tells the um, it just tells the source like this is where I want the center point of the of the note to be. That's what pivot is. Um, and then of course we have our our angle, which is just rotating it. That can rotate indefinitely, um, however long you want. Um, now I want to get into something interesting with size or just most most parameters in general. You notice that when you get to slide, when you move up the slider, it seems like it stops at a certain point. However, let's type in fifty. You can actually go beyond the original parameter scope if you manually type it. So wow. now if I scale this up, like now I'm at size 65, which is an absurd size and you probably wouldn't want that, but there are parameters that you would potentially want to adjust farther than um, what you would normally want. Like let's go soft edge as an example. Like let's say I wanted more soft edge than 0.2. Well, what if I just typed in one? Now it's like overly soft, <laughs> but you have the you have the adjustability now to go beyond that initial scope. So that can be really useful as well if you want to. Um, if it's if you feel like it's not giving you enough and you need a little bit more, um, you have that you have that ability. Okay. Okay. So, all right, let's go back to the transform. Um, and then of course our, uh, our edges, our canvas here, I'm just going to bring the size down. I should probably, I'm going to add a different mask onto this so it's easier to replicate. Uh, don't worry about doing this part. This is just for, uh, an example. I'm going to increase contrast here, bring down scale. Okay. All right, now if I uh, select one of these and select wrap, now you can see it duplicates it, um, but we are getting this little harsh edge and this will duplicate it indefinitely too. So if I decrease the size, like it goes on forever. Um, mm. So wrap will basically just duplicate it for every section, um, but it does, you can see that there's a harsh line right here. Um, if I change that edge to duplicate, then it just copies whatever that last pixel is up indefinitely as well. So if I drag this down, you can see it just stretches the, the edge pixels beyond the mask indefinitely. Um, I haven't mm. really found much of a use case for it, but it's there. Uh, but then we have mirror. And this one's really useful because now you can obviously like see where it's mirrored, but it allows you to have um, a seamless, a seamless line. So like you, it won't show any lines or anything. So you can just have mm, this, have right. this yeah, yeah. made up texture. Mm -hmm. And as I, as I adjust it or whatever, you can do some pretty weird stuff with it. And like, as I'm adjusting, you can kind of see where that mirroring spot is. But you know, when you zoom in, you don't really see it like outside of where you know it's mirroring. But anyways, um, so mirroring, mm -hmm. very useful, um, especially if you want to like go beyond the scope of uh, of this little little box right here. So right. very okay. useful stuff. Cool. Um, and that, that also like allows you to just like, if you wanted to make this keep going and going and going and just like have this like background stuff moving indefinitely, you could do that too. It's also very useful for transitions. Okay. Right. Okay. Uh, all right. I'm going to remove this. Uh, I'm going to da, 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 reset that. I'm just going to place a rectangle over top of it for now. It's not super important that you do that. Uh, but now we can go into some text. So mm. let's go ahead and throw a little text node on here and this is uh right here you can just click on this and it'll be it'll bring up text so you can drag this down here and let's drag it into our foreground of our merge 
And then initially you won't see anything because there's nothing mm -hmm. typed. But let's just right. let's just type in something here. I can. Oh, never mind. Cool. All right. Now, there is so much that we can do with this one text node that I'm not going to go over all of it because it would be insane. Um, I could do the whole session on just the text node. <laughs> um, sure, right. But let's just go over some of the basics. Like, obviously, you have your font selection. Um, you have your size parameter. Um, tracking, which is how far you want each individual piece of text to be from each other. Um, you have line spacing, which really only matters if you have two lines. Mm. But uh, that way, if you want to separate them more, you have line spacing. Uh, vertical anchor is how, like, so there's basically this box, this almost like an invisible box, uh, where uh, you can bind where you want the text to be anchored to. Um, it's kind of hard to explain, but you can also just automatically click here for a vertical anchor or a horizontal anchor if you want it bound to left and right. Um, those don't, like, you know, those are there. Um, but you can also have like a, a write on effect too. Like this is a very basic write on effect. Um, but if you start uh, both of these parameters at zero and then you can keyframe it, which keyframes the keyframe is the next thing we'll get into. Um, I'll probably lead on right into that from here, but you can keyframe this from, and you can just have it automatically write characters on. And that's like the most basic way to do uh, like a type write on effect um, in, right. in Fusion. It's just, we um so you can so you can do that and then we'll go to to layout this is typically where you can you know position where your text is going to be that's all pretty self-explanatory okay so yeah layout not really a whole lot to to explore here although you can add background to the text uh, if you wanted to um and, and that it looks like is manipulating through yeah because like it's because this is going color. to the foreground yeah yeah, cool. Okay. Yeah, and I, I can also like just make it full alpha as well. So like then it's just a solid background. <laughs> but if I brought in a transform here and shrunk the size, the background's still there. So the background will go over over top of the whole thing. But we'll mm -hmm. so I normally wouldn't really use the background part on here, uh, just because there's a much much better way to to work with that, which I'll show you in a bit. Uh, let's go ahead and reset these. All right, so transform. Um, honestly, you're probably not really going to be doing much in the actual transform because that's not actually where you uh, move a lot of the text by itself. Um, this is like if you right. want to add some some individual text rotation, like so, um, or you wanted to do like some like that skewing effect. Uh, this is how you would skew. So that's there, but shading, this is probably the most important tab of your, of your text node. So this is where all the really crazy stuff can happen. Um, cause you'll see here we have select element. Now these are, you can add, basically these are layers of the text node itself. Um, and what I mean by that is let's say I go into this second one and I click enable. Now you see we have a red border on mm -hmm. the on the text, but this red border is now individually adjustable. And then mm -hmm. we can add a third one. And if I enable this, now we have a drop shadow that is also individually adjustable. Oh, right, right, right. Okay. So you can you can add up to eight different text parameters on the same text node which you know it can get pretty crazy and they can all be uh, individually adjusted and moved around however you want so you know just a very very useful thing to have there um mm. so then you can enable and disable whichever ones you want for for preview and stuff i'm just going to keep it on this because you know drop shadow is always going to be in regardless of what people say mm, true <laughs> big true Wow. I'm going to get flamed for that. Um, 
And then we have our... <laughs> oh, my. Drop shadow for life, bro. Drop shadow for life. Like, um, I'll drop shadow my drop shadows. Come at me. You know? <laughs> I'll drop. I'll drop. Show me. I'll, I will be dropping shadows. Sorry. Please continue. <laughs> <laughs> oh no, we're never gonna get through this. All right. Nope. Um, so then, of course, your appearance is. I'm actually gonna go to the third one here and and show this. Uh, but your appearance is the type of uh, text you want. Um, so like whether you want a full text or just the outline, uh, or if you want like box background and I'll show you what you can do with this because it, it can get actually pretty cool or you can have like a border background and it looks off-center because this was supposed to be a drop shadow so it's it's offset down here that's the only reason why it is so I'm just mm -hmm. gonna keep it like that for now so don't worry about it um, but so those are your different adjustments you can do with that um, now actually I am gonna just do this I'm you know obviously doing this on the fly um so now if i if i press this we'll see we have you know a box around all of this but let's say we wanted to just add a background over the all the text and we didn't want this gap um you'll notice if we go if we we have this new parameter now it's called level if we click on this we can actually just do the whole text in and of itself and then that box is adjusted to be a perfect rectangle over all your text, um, however you have it set up. Um, and you know, you can e extend or retract the bounds uh, vertically and horizontally. Uh, you could add rounded edges to it if you wanted to, um, but this makes it very easy to, to stylize your text and you know, you can make it transparent if you wanted to. Um, this just, everything can be, everything can be done inside of here, which Jeez, just makes yeah. it so, so convenient and so useful. Hmm. Um, and then, uh, so I'm going to go back to where it was on the drop shadow. Uh, and then I'm going to go back to down here under position, uh, is where you typically set your offset. I think that's supposed to be 0.05, not 0.5. And then this one will set to point negative 0.5. So positive, uh, positive Y means up, negative Y means down, positive X means right, negative X means left. And that's I mean, <laughs> X, Y can record and you'll figure it out. Don't worry about it. Um, so uh, I'm trying to remember exact. Oh yeah. So softness, you can adjust the softness of the text as well. Now I'm going to, very briefly touch on expressions right now um these are uh things that you can get a lot more advanced on but um this is also uh in regards to like parenting so you'll notice like if you adjust softness of one you have to like drag and make sure like try and make sure they match on both parameters you don't have to do that um let's go ahead and we're going to right click on the letter y right here and then you'll see at the bottom, we have this button called expression. We're gonna click that. And then you'll see there's a plus on the, on the parameter right here. If we just click and drag that onto the X, now it's this Y parameter is bound to X. So now if I move X, it moves Y along with it. So you can scale it accordingly. Oh. And this can be bound to like you can bind as many things as you want to it. So like, what if I wanted to add some glow to it, bind glow to it, set an expression on glow, drag glow onto X. And now the glow is added to it. Now, obviously I wouldn't practically do this, but you can see that uh, it's doing. It. Now glow has a max limit. Some, some nodes actually do limit you. Um, Cause like you can't put blend beyond one. Like that just wouldn't make sense. So mm. there are some parameters that you can't adjust past the max because one is the max for a blend because that just means blend means max opacity. <laughs> um, okay. And right. zero is like opaque, like completely transparent. So like there are some parameters you can't adjust above it, but that's just kind of an example of like how you would parent stuff. Okay. So uh, I'm going to right click and actually remove the expression on glow because we don't need that. Um, but that's uh that's how you would um parent some stuff and you can also parent different nodes together so let's go ahead and just uh because i think is there anything else i want to touch on here that's not 
immediately apparent. Blending, yeah, blending is not not really important to talk about. That's fine. Um, yeah, image, uh, yeah, all this stuff won't really matter. So yeah, that's that's all we really need to cover in the text node. So let's go ahead and uh, start doing some, like the, the parenting part if you wanted to parent different nodes. Um, there's a couple of ways you can select multiple nodes, but uh, and put them in the inspector, but you see, so you see we click on transform one right here and I can control click transform two. You'll notice now they're both here, but not up at the same time. Well, there's this little, right. pin, there's this little pin button right here. If you click on pin, now I'll set it on transform one as well. Now I click on transform one. Now we can see them both at the same time. So this, uh, okay, can you can you do that just one more time for yes. me? So I'll unpin cool. these, I'll deselect it. So I only have transform one selected. I'm gonna control okay. click transform two so that they both show up here. And then you'll see okay. this pin tool right here. I'm gonna click pin right. on both of them. So now transform okay. one's already pulled up. I'm gonna open up transform two by clicking on it. And now we have them both pulled up. So let's say uh, I wanted okay. to, let's say I wanted to bind uh transform two to transform one so whatever transform two was transform one or whatever transform one was transform two would follow along so i'm gonna go ahead and right click size hit expression and now i can click and drag all the way down here onto the size of transform one now if i adjust mm. size on transform one it adjusts size for both parameters now, this is all well and good. However, this uh, the text is kind of outside what I want it to be. Like, I wish I could just um, adjust the size down here and have transform one be half the size of whatever this is so that I can keep the text in there. You can. Um, so we're going to go into the expression <laughs> and we're going okay, to- Okay, what do you know? <laughs> what do you know? Um, so in order to keep something half the size of what it's bound to, all you have to do is press slash two, which means divide by two. Ah. So, so now when you adjust size in transform one, transform two will always be half the size. And you can do it inversely okay. as well. If you wanted to make it twice the size, you can remove the slash and put in star. And that means multiply by two. So if I do this, now transform two mm. will always be double the size of transform one. So that's some very, uh, very useful stuff when it comes to like binding things together. Um, and this is effectively what parenting is in After Effects, except we can do it on a, a much easier basis per parameter. Um, mm. and there's, so, uh, yeah, I'm just gonna keep this at uh, divided by two, just so we can, you know, keep it the same. Um, so that's very nice, all well and good. Um, and you'll notice that there's this little dot in between every parameter that you adjust. If you click on this dot, it just resets it to default. I uh, just wanted to point that out before I forgot. Oh, cool. That way you don't, like, if you want, I ah, just want to reset it, you don't have to, like, drag all the way down and make sure it's, like, precise. You can just click this, boom, default. Okay. Let's get into keyframing. Now, this is where some of the, the fun stuff begins, and we really get to explore what's called the spline tool. The spline tool is where, like, a lot of your animation and stuff is going to happen. It's a very, very versatile tool. All right, so let's, uh, I'm just gonna unpin these because we don't need them pinned anymore. And I'm just gonna select transform one. So let's say I wanted this to move from, from left to right. So yeah. I'm going to, now I'm gonna make sure my timeline bar is where it's supposed to be. So I'm gonna go to the beginning and make it zero. You can also just type in zero here and it'll go to the beginning. Mm, okay. Well, so let's uh, let's bring this to our ideal starting point. I forgot I didn't bind that. Okay, this is actually something 
okay before we go into keyframing i'm going to talk about one more thing and that's called instancing um i'm going to delete this second transform here okay and what we're going to do and you can also delete that second transform too if you're following along we're going to click on transform one we're going to type in control c to copy command c if you're on a mac obviously and instead of pressing control v to paste we're going to do control shift v to paste now you'll notice you'll see you just made a note that says instance at the beginning. What does that mean? I'll tell you. So I'm gonna drag Yay. this on. <laughs> okay, I'm gonna shift drag this onto in between the text and the merge. Um, and now you'll see that we have, if you click on the instance transform, you'll see these green boxes. Um, mm -hmm. This actually means that every single parameter inside this instance transform is now bound to this transform. So if I and you can I you can move either one. It'll move both of them either way. So now every single parameter is bound to both transforms. Now this is uh another interesting thing because now let's say I wanted the size to be different on one of them but I wanted everything else to be the same. Well, on this instance transform, we can right click the size and then you'll see a button that says D instance. We're gonna click on that. Now, if I just transform one size, that one doesn't get a, adjusted. Everything else still does, but size does not. So now we can go back to pinning both of these. So we'll go ahead and pin them. And then on the instance transform, we can go ahead and you know make that expression again. Click and drag onto size. From instance Which expression, to, sorry? Which expression are you making? Uh, we're making an expression on size in instance transform. Right. And then we're dragging it onto the size of transform one. So we'll do that. Right, okay. I made a mistake. There we go. And then we're going to just add divide two again. So that way, now it's back to where we wanted it and everything else is parented uh, the way it should be. So now every single adjustment we make to any of the um to either the transforms uh will always be applied to both uh, but we but we still have the size where we want it so that's way you can have everything just automatically parented if you wanted everything to be the same except for like one or two parameters you can de-instance at a time so that's very very nice to have saves a lot of time makes things a lot easier so let's go back to uh the first transform i'm going to unpin this turn this deselect, uh, de just select transform one just to clean up our viewer here. All right, so let's go back to, uh, all right, we're at the beginning of the timeline. Let's see if we want this to go from, uh, from left to right. So we're going to drag center over to the left and we're just gonna drag it just a bit off screen. All right, and then you'll see the, all these diamonds that we have over here. These are your keyframes. So we're gonna set a keyframe here. And now we're gonna go to uh, if now I'm at my timeline set to 24 frames per second, so yours is probably set to either 30 or 60, which means that your your timing is gonna be slightly different. Um, but I'm just gonna make this take one and a half seconds. So on my timeline, that's 36 frames. I, if you're running um, a 30 FPS timeline, that's 45 frames. If you're running 60 FPS timeline, that's 90 frames <laughs> and okay. dude math 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 doing it, man. yes I'm, I'm doing the thing i'm doing the math all right um so now I'm, we're gonna drag center x over all the way and you'll notice as soon as we did that we made that diamond orange that means it set another keyframe and in order to go back and forth between keyframes you'll see there's a little arrow so you can go back to the previous keyframe or forward to the next keyframe. Mm -hmm. um, so now what we've done, whoops. Now what we've done is made an animation go from left to right. Now let's open the spline editor and see how much fun we can have with this. All right, Kay. this spline editor is lovely. So I'm gonna move this over and I'm just gonna select transform one. Now it looks like there's a lot of different things in here. Um, we don't need all of this selected. So what we're gonna do, so first thing, and I usually just do this by default, 
um, you'll see the, the three dots here on the top right of the spline editor under the menu. We're gonna click on show only selected tool. Okay. Now it cleans up our viewer so much and we only see the node that we have selected or we can you know, select two nodes with control click and we can see whichever ones we want but that way we only see what we want to select so mm -hmm. displacement uh is our center so we're going to click on that and then you'll see that you know sometimes keyframes can like be like a little bit out of the over the place and you kind of want to like zoom out or zoom in and that's by i'm zooming out and zooming in by pressing control on the keyboard and then scrolling in and out so that's how you zoom in and out or you can you know, click and manually drag these. But sometimes when you set keyframes, it's just, you know, really tedious to um, to have to like scroll all the way out and find the exact point. Um, I wish there was a way to, you know, have it snap to the right place immediately. You can! Um, so let's go to, <laughs> if you click on, <laughs> if you click on, <laughs> I'm so dumb. Uh, if you click on this button zoom to fit, it, constrains the window to all of the keyframes that are in the window but it like binds them to the edges makes it very very clean to view if you and then you can just click inside here just click inside not on one of the keyframes or on the line just click inside here to select it and you can press control a that'll select all of the keyframes inside of this viewer like literally every single one so <laughs> be careful if you have like a billion keyframes in there um, you can also uh, click and drag and, and highlight like so as well if you wanted to um, now as of right now when you when we do this animation it's just it's kind of very jarring just kind of does that uh, it's not probably not ideal um, if we're in this spline viewer we can press F once we have the keyframes highlighted and you'll see that that actually oh, rounded it out and that just made ease And then we can even do some more with this. If we press T, now we can adjust the ease in and out amount very easily. So I'm gonna go ahead and zoom out here. Um, and because there's only two keyframes and they don't have any out, like they only have one point, this is gonna be very easy to do. So I can just like say, I'm just gonna max these out to a hundred or something stupid and just like make the curve kind of insane. But you can, yeah. wee. <laughs> you can kind of like snap it over to the edge. But or if you inverted that, then you could have like a really quick entrance, freeze a little, and then quick exit. Yeah. So if you wanted to do yeah, that, yeah, okay. if you wanted to do that, you will need you. The best way to do that is to set another keyframe in the center. So I'm actually going to turn. Uh, so I'm gonna, actually going to do this. Um, and I think it's shift L. I'm just making sure. Yeah, it is shift L. All right. If you highlight all your, uh, keyframes and press shift L, it'll return them to linear. Um, and that just basically means it's, you know, straightforward, but that also means that this halfway point for which for me is 18 frames, you know, do the math yourself. It's fine. Um, you can set another keyframe here. We're going to press the diamond up here on center. So now we just added a, another keyframe here. Um, so we're only going to select, uh, let's see, how do I wanna do this? I'm just thinking through. Yeah, let's just select the first one and the last one. Um, and you can press control and drag to, to select both of them. Um, so we're going to press F again. And this mm. might, and then on the middle keyframe, what we're going to do is, yeah, it is shift S. We're going to do shift S. And that just added smoothness. Now we're probably going to do this again. Um, yeah, we're going to do this again. Uh, so let's highlight them all. Actually, no, not them all. The first and last one. We're going to do... Oh yeah, we wanted to go down. Yeah. So yeah, you can change. Yeah, you can change the direction um, of which the uh, the keyframes are pointed. So this this is how you do like a quick out and then ease in over here. So I'm just gonna make ease out, which really will be like how quickly it goes out because we just inverted it. I know it's confusing. Yeah. Bless you. 
I know it's confusing, but this will uh, make sense in a second. And then we'll go ahead and highlight this middle one, press Shift S again to smooth it out. And this will almost have like a, like it'll almost overshoot it and come back. Yeah, that's kind of what, so I've made yeah. this little, yeah, that's kind of what mine is doing. It kind of looks cool. Yep. So, a little wiggle. Yep, a little wiggle woggle. Um, but yeah, you can highlight both of those. And like, if that's too much, you can just bring it down to like 20 or something. And you can, you know, double click and type it in too, if that makes it easier. And then highlight this, press Shift S again. Yeah, that might be a little bit too little. So you can like keep fine tuning it and find out what the what the right balance is. Um, right. But I'm just going to go ahead and I'm going to remove that one for now. You don't have to if you don't want to. Um, but I'm just to showcase this is going to make it a little bit easier if I do. All right. So there's a couple more things that we can do inside the spline editor, which is, again, what makes it kind of insane. Um, so I'm going to add that ease back in just a standard ease. And then I'm going to highlight both of these and you'll notice we have a bunch of bottom icons down here. Now, there's a lot of stuff that we can do with these. Um, let's start with, yeah, let's start with reverse. If I hit reverse, you'll see that we just inverted it. So now, instead of starting from the left and going to the right, we're starting from the right and going oh. to the left. Yeah. So that's one thing, so we can reverse that back. Now, there's another one that says set ping pong. If we click that, now you'll see we just made this go forward and back and forward and back. So it basically, it'll reverse the keyframes that you just set and then loop through that indefinitely. So you can have an infinite looping, um, <clears throat> you can have infinite looping uh, keyframes without having to set keyframes at every single point. You can just click that and now you have an indefinite loop. Um, there's other indefinite loops that you can do too. Um, like if you just click set loop, then it'll just loop that same animation over and over again. Mm. Mm, okay. And that'll go indefinitely as well. Um, and then set relative, this one's interesting. So if we hit set relative, you'll notice it doesn't just loop the, the keyframing we just did. It adds on to it incrementally. So we can have it just keep going and then it'll keep going, keep going, keep going, keep going. So it'll continue that same animation and do it over and over again. But instead of going back to the beginning, it starts the animation from where it ended, if that makes sense. So it'll just keep going on here. So I'll better demonstrate this. I'm going to make this keyframe here. Uh, I'm just going to bring it a lot, lot more, lot lower. So if I do that, and then we set relative. So it does the animation at first, does it again, does it again, and it starts that animation from where it ended, and it'll just keep going. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. Huh. So that's also super useful. Um, another one that we can do, um, or another two, these are effectively the same, they just have different points of where they start and end, but they're called step in and step out. Uh, what these do is if I, if I hit step in, if I can click on it, it won't have any animation. It'll just go right from one point to another immediately. And it'll keep doing that indefinitely as well. Mm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And then, so that means that whenever the next keyframe is set, that's when the, the animation will happen. Um, step out is kind of the same thing, except it's when that first keyframe ends, it'll go immediately to the next one. So they, they effectively do the same thing, just like in a different order. So one um, moves it to the next point as soon as that keyframe hits. The other moves it to the next point right after that first keyframe is done. And what you once you like click on them and see what they do, that'll make a lot more sense once you do it. Um, but those are... Like, but that's how that works. Um, then we have our, let's, uh, I'm just going to go back to the set ping pong again. And I'm going to turn off 
Uh, step out. I'm just going to set that back to ease. There we go. Um, all right. So now. How did you we, flip them again? How'd you flip it? Oh, pit, set like ping pong. In, out, out, in. No, I mean, like, just flip it from, like, the start becomes the end, the end becomes the start, like, as a, like, just initially. Uh, the set ping pong? I'm pretty sure it's set ping pong. And then you uh, can... Set, set ping pong is, like, for the continuation. I mean, like, so right now we just have two points with nothing else. Right. And then you did something where it inverted the two points from start to end or end to start, like... Oh, reverse? The long... Yeah, that one. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. Cool. <laughs> there you go. All right. Um, and then to end the the step in and step out, you just uh, hit smooth on the end. And that's effectively the same as pressing F for, for easing. Um, mm. So then the, the last one we're going to look at, there are more uh, options that we can look at. But um, the last one I'm going to look at in here is called time stretch, especially because we're, we're definitely over time, uh, <laughs> which is fine. Yeah. Um, but mm -hmm. we're going to hit time stretch. Um, now, time stretch is interesting because now it selects your in and out range based on, you know, your two keyframes here. So we can stretch it back and forth to say how long we want it to, to do that animation. So we can effectively, like, l adjust the keyframes and have it still be the same amount of ease. And it'll, you know, adjust the same indefinitely. So if we wanted it to go really fast... You know, we could do it like so. If we wanted to take longer, we could do this. And then now it's moving a lot slower. So time stretch just makes it very easy to um, to adjust mm. all of your keyframes. Like, let's say we had like, I don't know, 20 keyframes inside here. That would be a huge pain to have to adjust every single one of them individually. Um, and, I'll, and I'll show you kind of what that looks like. So if I go, I'll just adjust this here. All right, so I'm just gonna set like a bunch of random keyframes here. Again, this isn't like super important, but, um, or it's not like you don't have to do the exact same thing I'm doing, but like you see how we have all these keyframes in here, like moving them all at the same, like trying to get them all the same exact length and keeping the same ease would be a huge pain. All you have to do is just hit time stretch. Once there, whoops. Once they're selected, you hit time range. Uh, and then once you click and drag, you see they stay the same uh, relative distance from each other when yeah, you drag it in and out. remains the same. Okay, okay. Yep, the ratio remains the same. So that's huh. super, super useful if you have a bunch of different keyframes in, in the midst of here. So, yep. So we're going to go ahead and just uh, delete all those because I think that's pretty much all of the spline editor that I wanted to cover. Um, yeah, that'll, the spline editor will make things a lot, lot more fun. All right. I'm going to reset the center, uh, and the default center for pretty much everything is going to be 0.5 and 0.5. Um, and that, it makes it easier because, uh, regardless of what your resolution is set to inside of your fusion comp, your centers are always going to be the same. Um, mm, so it's it. like okay. if you're working on a 1280 by 720 timeline, 1920 by 1080, 4K, your center numbers are going to be the same each time instead of like, instead of, you know, you normally had like a position where it's like you had to set it to, I don't know, 960 by 540. Oh, shoot. This video is smaller. I have to readjust it now to uh, 360 by whatever it was. I don't know. Um, mm -hmm. This way, these will always be the same relative to the resolution so you don't have to worry about like changing it if you change your resolution so that's just a, a a nice thing so it's like that's why center x is when you hit when you do zero for center x it's all the way to the left side one is all the way to the right and then one on y is all the way on the top zero on y is all the way in the bottom and then 0.5 is centered for both Cool. So zero zero, bottom left corner, one one, top right corner. Yep. Cool. Yep. Cool. That's how that works. Um, and then just a quick thing, I'm just gonna do. And again, this is not something you have to do. I'm just gonna showcase this if you have keyframes already set up. Um, I'm just gonna make like something really quick so so it's visible. Um, but so we have this here, right? 
this little animation. Um, any node that has uh, some sort of motion in it, if you go to your settings in the inspector, you'll see that there's a motion blur one. And I will warn you, you probably will want to have a good GPU for this. Um, but you click on motion blur and you can up the quality. And now when we play it through, you can actually see a motion blur effect happening automatically without having to like set a bunch of blur parameters and whatnot. You can just make motion blur happen. Mm. And this can be very useful if you want to make, make a custom transition that you don't want to just use a directional blur. You can just like use a transform node and just make the transition happen. It's very, very easy to do. And I can showcase that real quick, actually. So um, we're pretty much done with this fusion composition. If you want to delete it, you can, uh, because I'm going to make a new fusion comp and showcase one more thing after, after I show this uh, motion blur. So I'm just going to drag this clip back into the timeline. Um, and we're going to use what we learned with those, with those keyframes. Uh, and I'm just going to drag this over here. All right. So we're going to bring that adjustment clip back in. And this is a great way where, of how you can create your own custom transitions. So I'm going to make sure this is over in the middle right here. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to go ahead and open Fusion on that adjustment clip. I'm going to bring in a transform node. And the first thing I'm going to do is set edges to mirror so that when I go beyond the bounds, it, you can still see it. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to set a keyframe here at the beginning. And I'm going to go to the end and then drag this off to yep it's a 2.5 and it's set perfectly centered like if you're if you're on a 0.5 you're perfectly centered if you don't change size or anything um so we're gonna do that we see we have our motion right here but let's go ahead and open our spline tool again and then we can do what we did before if we press uh command control a we can highlight the keyframes control f we can make that uh transition happen here. I'm just going to add a little bit more ease to, to both of them. I, I typically like it at 50. Do it, do it is tasteful to you. So now we have kind of like a whip transition almost. And now here's the fun part. We go to settings, add motion blur, increase the quality if you want to. And now we have automatic motion blur set up. And we just used the transform node. We didn't even have to add, add a blur, blur node to it. So now when we watch this transition and play it back, seamless whip. Wow. And what's great about this is you can save these as presets. Um, so you can go up to view and then show power bins. Mine's already pulled up, so uh, it's not showing there. Um, but if you go to media pool and you'll see power bins show up here, you can actually click and drag this adjustment clip inside that power. Can you click and drag the adjustment, <laughs> clip. <laughs> click and drag the adjustment clip inside here. And we'll just call this whip transition. And now the great thing with this is this whip transition will be available in every single project you open in Resolve. This will automatically be here inside that power bin. So now I can delete this adjustment clip, but now I can just bring in this whip transition. And now I have a transition right here. And I just made that. Brilliant. Okay. Just like that. Wow. Okay, so that's cool. Yep. So that's power bins are great for presets. If you want to set presets, use power bins. Power bins show up mm. are, are like assets that show up in every single project you open without having to import it. All right. The last thing, and this is just a, a fun little bonus thing before we get to the Q&A, which we should have gotten to a half an hour ago, but it's OK. Uh, Perfect. <laughs> so we're just going <laughs> to we'll just add another blank fusion comp. Um, 
and like we're gonna go ahead and open up fusion and what we're gonna do is we're gonna play with some 3d text i'm not gonna go into like the granular stuff on how the 3d environment works and resolve but we're just gonna make some 3d text very quickly um yeah. so in order to make 3d text there's a couple prerequisites uh, as as uh, as it were the first thing we need to add is what's called the renderer 3d it's going to be this icon on the far right we're going to click that and we're just going to drag that onto media out and then we're going to add a merge 3d we're going to drag this output into the renderer and then we have like a transparent space. Now, something I didn't talk about through this whole thing, I probably should have mentioned this earlier, um, but you'll notice we have two windows up here, right? Mm -hmm. um, now, normally, like under this media out, you'll see that we have these two dots here. Uh, one of them is lit. This means which, which viewer it's going to. But you can also press one and two. So if I press one on merge 3D, that means I'm viewing that node in the first viewer. So, and I, I can showcase this again, like if I pull in just a regular background node, oh. here, I'll make sure you can see it. If I press one on this background node, that means we see that in the first viewer. So it's like your source and preview viewer or program viewers, source and mm. program viewers. Okay. Okay. So that's basically what this is. Just wanted to make sure I actually mentioned that at some point. <laughs> um, yeah, fair. So, but the... Merge node is the only way, uh, well, not the only way, but it's the, the best way to see what your 3D environment looks like. Um, so I'll just go ahead and press 2 on media out so we can actually see what this looks like. So now let's go ahead and actually add our 3D text. So let's test text the 3D node here. And I'm going to drag this into the Merge 3D. And we're going to type in some text. And then in this merge viewer over here, I can scroll in and out by con pressing control and scrolling. So now we have our text. And if we go down to extrusion in the inspector, when we have text 3D selected, oh, we can right. increase extrusion depth. And now we have actual 3D text. Now we're going to want to add some depth to this and like actually stylize it a little how you, bit. How are you twisting the camera? Oh, uh, I keep doing that like without thinking about it. I press mm -hmm. Alt and then click in on the scroll wheel and drag. Ah, yeah, cool. That one's not easily apparent, but yeah, press and hold Alt. If you just press in on the scroll wheel and click and drag, that moves you around the environment like this. If you press Alt and click and drag with the middle scroll wheel, then it will rotate around. Okay. Okay. So cool. <laughs> forgot to mention that. So. Um, now we're going to do something really quick because, like, you know, we have 3D text, but it looks very bland, obviously. So we want to add some mm -hmm. depth to it, some texture to it. Um, let's go to Renderer 3D. Let's click on that. And then you'll see this lighting tab that says Enable Lighting and Shadows. We're going to click both of those. You'll see the text go black. That's fine. Mm -hmm. um, we're also going to do the same thing in this viewer so we can see the same thing that the media out sees. So we're going to right click inside this viewer. And we're going to go to 3D options and then enable both lighting and shadows. You'll have to click on it twice. Okay. So now okay. you'll probably see that this has some texture, but it doesn't show up here. That's because there's no lighting on this yet. So what we're going to do mm. is what, there's, there's a couple different lights that we can add. Uh, spotlight is usually the default one. Um, I'm just going to add, I'm, I'm pressing shift space for this. And I'm just going to add, let's see, we can type in light and we can see our different lights that we have here. We're going to use directional light. And the great okay. thing with a directional light, and we're going to pipe it into the merge node, make sure we do that. And now we can actually see we have some light in here. The great thing with the directional yeah. light is it doesn't matter where it's positioned. Its position will not make uh, any sort of difference. Um, on what light is being casted onto the text. Um, this is just like, think of it as like an infinite light source that's going a specific direction. What does matter okay. is your rotation. Um, so if you click on this icon up here in the top right, or top left, sorry, that says rotate, right. then you can see our three different 
axis parameters. Um, so red is your X axis, uh, your green is your Y, and blue is your Z. Um, Z is not really going to do anything uh, for, for this particular effect, so we're just going to focus on X and Y right now. Um, but you can also go into your inspector and just go to transform and it'll be basically those same adjustments, right? Um, but mm. So uh, I'm gonna just reset these because I don't need them. Um, so if I move X, you'll see how we're affecting the texture of this uh, of this text. But we're actually giving it some depth here. Let's uh, let's adjust Y. And again, yeah. oh, actually no, sorry, I'm sorry. Z does do something if X and Y are <laughs> have been adjusted. So Z does do Correct. something. So. Yeah. But, you know, it, it can get funky if you start adjusting that, too. So I just use X and Y if I can. But, yeah, you can adjust where it's pointing. I'm going to raise this up a little bit. Um, and I can, you know, click on this text 3D and go into the transform. And I can just push this back in Z space. So if you click on text 3D and go to transform and go to Z and just drag it backwards, it'll push it back. So, but now we have some, some 3D text and there's like a lot of different things we can do with this. So if we go back into the text 3D node and go to text, uh, we can change the style of the, the extrusion. So if we add some bevel depth and width, you have to add them both before anything shows up. But I'll go ahead and zoom in on this over here. You'll see that we can, uh, increase some some of the front extrusion or like how wide it is but we can just uh texturize the um the text a lot and there's there's so much you can do with the um the texturing of the actual text too there's like there's so much that i don't have time to get into but that is right. basic very basic 3d text um that you can play with um, if you wanted to use the spotlight route, like directional light is going to be easier. Um, I'm just going to show this. You don't have to do this part. I'll just uh, click the spotlight, which is right here. I'll click this in and you'll see that wherever this spotlight is, it actually does matter. Um, so positionally, it will change where um, light hits the text. Uh, so we're going to go ahead and turn this on. You know, you can rotate it. Oh, that's cool. So you can you can do like a spotlight effect if you wanted to. You could keyframe that. Uh, you can extend. You can increase the cone angle uh, to make it wider. Uh, penumbra angle. You can increase that to basically diffuse the light. Um, and and again, you can go beyond the parameters. So like twenty is the normal max, but if you type in fifty, then you can you can make it even more soft, and just have it like absurdly soft light, which is you know, sometimes very pleasing. Um, but then you can have like this nice little, like, we, <laughs> so yeah, spotlights can be fun to play with, uh, as well. If you want to use something that's a little bit more in detail. Right. Okay. So, and again, like, you know, all the rotation translation, all that stuff matters, but yeah, so that's, that's 3d text in a nutshell. Um, and then to pipe this back in, like, let's say you were putting it over top of a background. Um, you, all you, whoops, not transform. All you have to do, let's say you had your standard, you know, background into merge into media out. Mm -hmm. the, what the renderer 3D is actually doing is translating 3D into 2D. So once you drag this output from render 3D onto the merge, there you go. Oh, okay. So now it's it's implanted onto uh, the foreground of the merge. So re render 3D is necessary because it translates 3D into 2D. But that is 3D text so, in a nutshell. Where okay, um, where is the to do like quick media in and media out? Where are those at? Or is there a quick way to do those? To quick media in. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I said, yep. No, I, I caught up. I caught up. Oh, okay. <laughs> I did it. So we're here, and then the renderer needs to go to the merge. Yeah. So the renderer is the transition point between 3D and 2D space. Yes. And it's okay. what renders the 3D space so that it can be displayed in 2D. 
Got it. So when you say on the right side it says Bax is cool, I guess, how do you get that text? Like right now, I have text, but it's it's too big. No. Oh, like, yeah. So, so when click... I change the size, nothing happens. Oh, it so click. Okay, so click on text 3D and then go to transform. And then under translation Z, drag that backwards. Ah. Transform. Where do you see? So I don't see translation Z. I don't see translation. Oh, transform. I'm sorry. I was in the transform two to the left, not the transform. Right oh here. yeah, that's sorry. That's confusing. I, okay, got it. Yeah. Uh, all good. Yeah. All good. All good. Okay. Now I got it. Ah, we're good. Yeah. They really shouldn't have cool. two different transforms. <laughs> But uh, yeah, that can be a little confusing. Naming but, okay. conventions, I'm, we love them. All right. Yes. Okay. Cool. And then that's oh, that's so cool. Okay. 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 Yep. Wow. So that Jeez. is the the basics of a lot of different fusion materials. I think I pretty much went through um, all that we we really wanted to cover. So. Um, Thank you so yeah. much for for doing this. This was this was a lot of fun. <laughs> well, the pleasure is mine. Are you kidding me? The pleasure is mine. I, I'm trying to I'm trying to put my brain into just like full sponge soak mode. And what's crazy is because you're so familiar with the material, there's a lot of times where I'll either like have to kind of intuit something because you've like like or I would just stop and ask like wait how'd you do this and you're like oh my gosh you're right I just do that so automatically <laughs> so much I know that I don't that's... even think about it so so but that actually is that that's awesome because then I know these are like I'm starting to kind of get into your process and your head about the things that become second nature for editors uh in the in fusion in the fusion space hotkeys are vital oh, to huge. speed and repetition and so that's where I am as far as like all of my, um, I mean, for people who maybe I, maybe we should have done this at the beginning, but maybe you can just like put this at the beginning or something. <laughs> so I'm, I'm a video, like I'm a video editor. I do video editing, but I, I have no familiarity with fusion. And so all of my edits have just been using, uh, you know, media cut edit and then write to deliver. Sometimes I'll pop into to the color tab just to kind of mess around with like, uh, some masking in there or like the magic mask or, you know, just stuff like that. But otherwise that's all I do. And so I'm trying to translate what I know about the edit tab and bring that over into fusion as somebody who is a complete novice with node based programming in general. Um, and so that's why this has been created and that's why it's really cool to hear your workflow and the way that you're going about learning shortcuts, learning hotkeys, using them effectively, and then all the different tools in fusion, because that is taking like the entire, um, the entire like arsenal of DaVinci resolve and what you can make to the next level, which is where I'm trying to get. So that's, so there, there's your intro to what the hell we're doing. Good. <laughs> Great. Exactly. Yeah, and it's it's one of those things where like fusion in and of itself feels really daunting because After Effects has been around for so long that everybody just almost instinctively knows how After Effects keyframing and layers how they all function, but node based is a it's almost like learning a new language. Um, right. So having to find a way to be a translator and like say, you know, backgrounds are like solids from After Effects and here's uh, some similar properties that they have, but here's how they function right. differently. And like, this is how exactly. you make new layers and stuff and just finding ways to relate what you know how to do in After Effects into Fusion um, makes, at least makes a learning process a lot less daunting so that when you start playing around with things seeing what they do like it, it becomes like oh like oh this is what that's doing or, or like it's kind of like a puzzle piece where it's going from one point to the next point to the next point and depending how i connect things it changes how what the outcome is um, where in after effects that doesn't really apply um so it's just like a different if it's, it's a different way of looking at compositing um and mm. again we we like didn't even scratch the surface of what fusion can do like we had we didn't even go into oh, it's crazy we didn't I even go you, into, yeah we didn't even go into how it tracks there's multiple different ways to track things like the planar tracker um is beautiful i've used Ooh, it so many so, times dude it's funny you bring that up like just uh just um 
last week I was looking up and working with the planar tracker just to attach, you know, like a logo to a wall. And I was just kind of messing around with that. But it's like even just in what you've gone over today, you've only gone over like even the basic use of everything you went over. It, it's it, like the depth of fusion is really up to the user. It's oh, crazy yeah. just looking like yeah just even seeing the way you're like yeah and here's this and then i'm not going to get into this but if you do this thing that you could take five and a half years to learn to be a professional and you know it's like the, just every single aspect of fusion really does seem to be that robust oh yeah for sure i mean really the biggest limit is what you can what you can think of it's just a matter of like once once you overcome the barrier of oh this is how i accomplished this then right like and once you hit the basics and you get all the basics then it becomes so much more easy to expand on to onto everything else and just it it allows life to be <laughs> life to be more fluid mm, so yeah right but yeah thank you guys so much for joining this was uh this was a great time uh, appreciate you yeah. all sticking around uh checking it out if you follow along hope you learned something and uh and Bax, i love you <laughs> my sweet boy my sweet my sweet, sweet, sweet boy, boy. No, I, pre dude, I appreciate it. i appreciate the help and uh yeah i can't can't thank you enough and i look forward to you know using these using these tricks and tips as early <laughs> as this afternoon on some edits i'm gonna be working on dope